Hey guys, um, I'm trying to get this up a little early for you because I think that it'll be helpful for you to see my lecture as you think about the movie. Um, and what we're going to really talk about today for this le the lecture this week is transformations of the views of Spartacus. I think you've all heard the phrase, if you, um, um, those who ignore the past are condemned to repeat it. And more likely just injunctions of learning from history. You should learn from history. You should learn from the past. The thing about history is, though, people tend to focus, even looking at the same facts or the same story, and usually there are different facts that can be focused on, different facts that you can look at. It's that people, um, people actually tend to use the past to bolster whatever point of view they have. And the Roman Empire is a really good case in this. Like, whatever you don't, whatever somebody doesn't like in their own society, they tend to say, okay, this is what caused the fall of the Roman Empire. I mean, in the United States especially, because the United States is a really big, very powerful country. The Roman Empire was a very big, powerful country. So whatever people don't like in the United States, they've tended to say, okay, this is what's caused the fall of the Roman Empire. And you can see that in, um, in England as well before that. So, in movies, historical movies tend to tell you much more about the time that they're made than the time that they're trying to portray. So in this case, this movie was made in the 1960 United States, and this actually tells you more about the United States in the 1960s than it does about ancient Rome, although it does tell you some interesting things about ancient Rome. And one of my goals of the course is when we're looking at ancient history to see how this history has been used, how have people, how have people looked at this, how has history lived on. The past doesn't change, but the way people view the past does change. People's perceptions of the past does um, do change. There's a phrase I think I've told you before from George Orwell. Um, those who control the past, contr um, those who control the present control the past. So those who control the past control the future. Say that again. Those who control the present control the past. Those who control the past control the future. So whoever who's in power presently has a big view of, of who, you know, how people view the past. You know, they're, they control the history books, things like that. And then those who view, then those who control the past control the future in that, you know, the whole idea of learning from the past, it's a very powerful thing, but like what kind of past? So we're going to talk about transformations of views of the historical Spartacus and then talk about this particular movie. So you saw in the movie that the slavery was, you know, that, 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 that you know, the, the slaves were viewed very sympathetically um, to the extent that some of the real life Spartacus was kind of softened. The Kurt Douglas um, Spartacus was much more genial and cheerful and less brutal than the actual Spartacus. Um, you know, we see, in our society, we see slavery as very negative. So a slave rebellion, we're tended going to understand the slaves. Now, when you look at Plutarch and Apian, who are the two schol the two, two scholars who wrote about them before, um, before the Roman, and who were actually lived in the Roman Empire, they both view the control of the slave rebellion in positive terms. Um, you didn't have to read those, um, but, but that's what the um, the recent history of that you read um, told you. And I just in case you were interested, I actually put the originals on. I, I made sure I mark mark them as optional. So if you're interested, you can look and see the originals of what they said are online as well. But as you read in the recent history of Spartacus, they both really viewed them in very positive terms. Plutarch seemed to admire Spartacus. Um, he talked about how intelligent and cultured he is. But that can also be something that he was afraid that the idea of a barbarian kind of um, a barbarian taking over and beating the Roman Empire. He needs to kind of see him as something, um, someone special. So they said he's more like a Greek than a Thracian. So there, there are things like that. And there's, if you know, in the movie, there's a scene where um, in, in, in the tent where the Sicilian pirates who are coming actually or the, or the um, advocate for the Sicilian pirates coming says oh everyone says you're of a noble birth because the Romans can't be you know be to be beaten by an, um, a mere slave and that's a reference to this in this time um, in their society slavery was seen as a positive it was um, or, or was at least something that was acceptable there was no critique of slavery then they didn't almost have the energy to the mental um, knowledge or the 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 idea that slavery was bad was not a popular idea. So they viewed Spartacus as a bad guy, as, as a you know, terrible person, and then um, Crassus, who saved him, was good. Um, you know, it was, it was positive. They, they, the, the world was put back to the way that it should be. 
Now, in the 1700s, you see growing anti-slavery sentiment. Um, that's the time of transatlantic slavery, which really was a new and more brutal form of slavery. We might talk about that at some time in the future, how, you know, how, how slavery fit in, how the slavery you're seeing now fit in. Um, and so, with transatlantic slavery, with, with, um, you're with the growing slave trade, in England especially, and in some other areas, th there started to be a growing anti-slavery sentiment. And so, in 1760, a French um, tragedy, a French scholar, writer, looked at, uh, looked at Spartacus and saw something new, and saw that, that hey, this is great that, that the slaves were able to rise up. And he presented Spartacus as a noble in anti-slavery. And that's how um, Spartacus is, has been viewed in modern times. When people look at Sparta, the slave rebellion, really after the 1700s, they tend to see it as a positive thing, and it's a sad tragedy that was shut put down. So it's kind of on its head. Karl Marx, um, who was alive from 1818 to 1883, he was the father of Marxism. Um, he believed that people who were oppressed should rise up. So to him, Spartacus was a hero. Spartacus was a perfect example of people who are downtrodden rising up. And so again, with anti-slavery sentiment, Spartacus became heroic. We didn't get any new knowledge about, her, uh, about Spartacus. We have the same knowledge that we have from Plutarch and Appian. But his views, the idea of slavery, slave, um, slaves rebelling against their masters, started to seem much more sympathetic. So now we have the 1916 movie Spartacus, which you just saw or are going to see. And this is, this movie is really about, this movie is re, um, really, again, proves the idea that you can tell as much or more of a movie, it tells you as much or more about the time that it was made than the time that it's showing. So this is, a, the Cold War follows World War II. I'm hoping that you remember something about this from your U.S. history courses, even those of you who aren't history majors. Um, the Cold War was a conflict between the United States and Soviet Union. And usually at this point, I ask the class to, to someone, because there's usually a few people, quite a few people in the class who can tell me something about this. So we talk about this, but I'll, I'll just explain it to you briefly, since obviously I can't ask you any questions in this format. Um, the United, um, the United States and the Soviet Union were at war, and I usually ask, or not at war, that they started having conflicts with each other, but they couldn't go to war, and the reason is because of nuclear weapons. Um, the United States did the, um, exploded the first nuclear weapon in 1955 against Japan. They thought they'd have this for 20 years. In fact, they, had, they were the only people to have this for four years, um, and the Soviet Union in 1949 had nuclear weapons just four years later. So, they would destroy the whole world if they got into an actual direct conflict. And so you had what was called a Cold War. Now, especially since the Soviet Union got the um, nuclear weapons so fast, there was great concern following World War II, which, you know, this is um, previous, this is like the, you know, the late 1940s, early 1950s, especially after 1949. Um, and the same, at the same time, by the way, people, the People's Republic of China be, um, came into being, the com China went communist, which was a huge shockwave in the United States. So there was growing concern about leftists within the United States. And that led to McCarthyism of the 1950s, the idea that people who were sympathetic to the Soviet Union, sympathetic to communism, would betray the United States. It would make the United States weaker. And that led to, again, as I said, McCarthyism, which a lot of you probably know, McCarthyism was named after Senator McCarthy from Wisconsin in the 1950s, and he said he had a list of 200, sometimes the name would change because he actually didn't really have a list of communists, but he said he had a list of communists who were weakening the United States from within. And that became very frightening. And you started to have a lot of people being fired, some of whom actually were, um, there, there were actually Soviet spies, that wasn't a complete myth that there were Soviet spies, there were Soviet spies in the United States, so there were people who actually were working for the Soviet Union, Union. but it became anybody who had ever expressed sympathetic sympathy to the communism. There were some people who had been communist in the 1930s when communism was actually much more popular in the United States because of the Great Depression and had actually since stopped being communist. Um, or there are some people who just, um, you know, exercising what should have been the freedom of thought or freedom of choice that they should have been guaranteed as an American citizen, just thought there were some really good things about communism. Or there are some people who didn't like communism but were sympathetic to the poor. And because communists are sympathetic to the poor, they could also be denounced as being 
potential communists. So, so many people lost their careers, people lost government jobs. Um, there's just a whole huge list of this. But specifically in Hollywood, you saw this. You saw a lot of writers that had been popular in the 1930s and 1940s basically losing everything in the 1950s and being blacklisted. And you had this idea of naming names. This is actually really important. They would name names so people would have, they would say, tell me who, you know, tell, name, if you name another communist, if you name somebody else, your, your own punishment will be less. And this happened to the screenwriter for um, the person who wrote Spartacus. His name was Dalton Trumbo. He was a blacklisted writer. He had been betrayed by some other people who had actually named him as a communist. Um, and he was, certainly was not a Soviet spy at all. He had some sympathetic, you had some sympathy to communism. He was definitely left, you know, he was definitely a leftist, but he was not a, um, a Soviet spy. But he had still been lost everything, and so he had actually written the, he had actually written some other things, but he could never have have his name on anything. Um, and you know, obviously, it was really hard for him to get work. His life was basically ruined. And then Kurt Douglas actually in 1960 chose him and he was producing and Kurt Douglas had a lot of power in Hollywood at the time and he insisted that Dalton Trumbo be given credit for this. So Dalton Trumbo was given credit for this. If you look at the very beginning of the credits, you probably didn't pay that much attention, but you'll see screenwriter Dalton Trumbo and that is actually a really important moment in film history. Because this is the movie that broke the Hollywood blacklist to a degree. Um, the, four, the American Legion, of course, did, um, because of Dalton Trumbo, they, they did protest against this or protest against the movie. But the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, came to see the film. And when he did that, a lot of other people did it. It was actually a hugely grossing film. It was a huge successful film. Um, very made a lot of money. It was very, very popular. It became a classic film almost right away. And that, in a way, broke the blacklist. Um, JFK coming to see it got a lot of press. In general, the movie got a lot of pro positive press at the time. Um, and Dalton Trumbo's career was back. But more important than that, the idea of blacklisting um, faded. And so this is seen as the movie that broke the blacklist. It's obviously somewhat more complicated than that. It wasn't like, you know, overnight there was no more blacklist. But this certainly greatly weakened the power of the blacklist. So there are several scenes in the movie that are directly related to McCarthyism. And one of them is the most famous one, the I'm Spartacus scene. Now, as the, the, what, what you read about in the Guardian um, article told you, that that actually never happened as a scene. Um, Spartacus, the real Spartacus, was probably killed in battle. Or, I mean, that, that's probably what mostly what would happen. He's killed in battle as a, um, a lot of people flee. Some people think that he actually might have been able to flee. Um, but his body was not, like, there, there was not a noble scene where everybody tried to defend him. But there was in the movie, and it's one of the most famous scenes, um, Crassus basically asks the, uh, the, the other slaves to name names, very similar to how in McCarthyism, Hollywood writers and a lot of other people were saying, okay, who, who's a communist? Name a communist and you, you know, you, you'll, you won't be so bad for you. You know, you, your, your career will be killed. I mean, there weren't literally people being, you know, slaughtered for that, but people's, you know, the career death. So it won't be so bad if you name names. So that, and that was that, and that was what was going on there. Um, and then they refuse to do it. They all say, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. When they say, I'm Spartacus, they're like willing to die for him. And then so many people say that they're Spartacus that it makes it meaningless. Um, unfortunately, in real life, that doesn't always happen. People aren't always, always willing to sacrifice themselves for each other. But it was a, it's a beautiful scene and a noble scene. And it kind of holds up this ideal. Like, don't give in to the power that be. Like, sacrifice yourself for your friends. And it's, again, a very one of the most powerful scenes. It's also one of the most... Um, because it's such a powerful scene, such a famous scene, it's been parodied a lot. If you've ever seen Monty Python, The Life of Brian, there's a scene at the end where, where um, he, Brian is actually going to be taken off the crucifix, and then everyone goes, I'm Brian, I'm Brian, I'm Brian, and that's a um, part of the I'm Spartacus. There are a lot of other, if you just want to Google I'm Spartacus um, parodies, you could find a lot. Um, at, at the Brett Kavanaugh trial, um, Cory Booker referred to his uh, I'm, uh, his I'm Spartacus moment. Um, it wasn't a totally great analogy, and he was mocked for that. But you can kind of see how the idea of the I'm Spartacus scene is still is still kind of being used in popular culture. When you look at the conflict between Gracchus, now Gracchus in real we talked about the Gracchi brothers in the last lecture, and the timeline is off actually somewhat. But there was a Gracchus who really was very concerned about the poor. Um, and he did actually commit suicide at the end. So that part is real. 
Um, and other people did did accuse him of being, he was, he was in the Senate, other people did accuse him of being part of the mob. He didn't kill himself because of the Spartacus Rebellion. Um, that wasn't part of it at, at all. But he did kill himself because he knew he was going to be killed. Um, he actually was going to be killed. There wasn't the offer to like to, to um, li you know, basically go live on a, a farmland. He actually was going to be killed in real life, and he killed himself. But that part is real. And there, so there was a Gracchus who really did care deeply about the poor and, and had a lot of social reforms. We talked about that last week. And there really was a Crassus who was responsible for putting down the rebellion. And so you see where Crassus talks about a list um, in the scene. This is toward the end of the movie with Gracchus. And he says, um, enemies of the state. So I have a list of enemies of the state. That wasn't a term that was used in ancient Rome. That was a term that was used in... Um, that was a term that was used in um, by like during kind of McCarthyism. It was kind of a very 1950s term. So that term was kind of a nod to people, or sort of like letting people know what the, everybody listening at the time would have understood what was going on. When Crassus and, and Gracchus was an enemy of the state number one. That never they didn't. It wasn't in real life this direct enmity between Crassus, but specifically in Gracchus. Although Gracchus did have a lot of enemies. Um, but the idea that Crassus was saying enemies of the state. Um, and basically saying that, you know, he, he wants him to give in. Again, that was kind of more of a McCarthyism thing. Like, do now kind of denounce your ideas, kind of give in, and I'll, you know, and then I'll let you live. That, again, was more of a 1950s thing. In real life, Gracchus, which would have been killed, we would have just slaughtered him. They would have kept him alive, you know, for, you know, to, um, to be, be carted out, to, to um, speak to his followers. Um, Cross is much more powerful in the movie than in the primary sources. Um, he was wealthy in the primary sources. Um, he was seen as a, a wealthy person, um, and he was a, a, a noted, well-known Roman scholar, but he never tried to take over. He never became a dictator. He never had that much, the same kind of degree of power. It was just sort of useful to set up this idea of this kind of elite person who, you know, people wanted to, you know, kill, or, or, or not wanted to kill people who, who wanted to basically to take over everything and who hated Gracchus. So the conflict between Gracchus and Crassus is, is really a conflict between people who, you know, care about the poor and then the elite people who don't care about the poor. Um, what was kind of set it up by the movie. That's how Dalton Trumbo set it up. In real life, they didn't have, you know, Crassus was not the only spokesman for the Roman elite. You see the, the very famous move when, move st when Rome stopped being a republic and became an empire. Um, and that's very much associated with Julius Caesar. He himself didn't become an emperor. He was, if you've read the play, the Shakespearean play, Julius Caesar, you'll know it's pretty well known. He was killed, but then later on after that, his heir, Octavian, was the one who actually did make Rome an, um, an empire rather than a republic. Um, this wasn't actually directly connected to, the, to Spartacus at all, but the movie makes this connection just because it's something that's kind of powerful and well known. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this movie, and really what this week was about, and it was easier to do if I could have talked to you more in person, but what this week was really about looking at a movie that portrayed ancient Rome, it was to help you kind of become interested in that scene, that, that period, even with all its, um, cha even with all its changes, even with all, you know, the movie's inaccuracies, it, you know, it does give, there are some things that are actually pretty accurate about the movie, for example, there really were six million people killed, as, as your, um, one of the readings says. There really were six million people killed and crucified, lining the Appian Way. That happened. There's some things that happened in it. There really was a rebellion. Um, but also, so to get you to interest in that period of, of Spartacus, but also to get you to think about how, basically, how, um, how, how history changes over time, how, how the way people perceive history changes over time, and how so much of what happens in the past how we see the past is very much connected to our present lens. Okay, I said this lecture was going to be shorter than the last lecture, and it is. We're kind of um, coming on 20 minutes, so I'm going to say goodbye to you guys um, right now. Feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you.